Thank you for downloading this episode of A History of Central Florida podcast. This is the podcast where we explore Central Florida's history through the artifacts found in local area museums and historical societies. This series is brought to you by Riches, the regional initiative to collect the histories, experiences, and stories of Central Florida and the Orange County Regional History Center. I am Bethany Dickens, and I will be your host for this episode titled Leather Cap and Goggles. Leather. It's a durable material, but would you trust it with your life? Would you travel over 100 miles an hour in a ramshackle vehicle with nothing but leather separating your skull from the hard ground? And yet, men from all over the globe traveled at these speeds on the hard packed sands of Ormond and Daytona. The sport they participate in has changed. Leather hats and goggles, like the one found in the Halifax Museum at Daytona Beach, have been replaced with fiberglass helmets. What hasn't changed, though, are spectators' interest in witnessing thrills and danger on the racetrack. The objects featured in today's podcast are a pair of goggles and a hat worn by a driver who broke the Landspeak record several times. You might associate Daytona racing as something uniquely a product of American-born drivers and a style of racing only featured in the United States. But the history of racing in the city is more international. In fact, it was an English racer named Malcolm Campbell who wore the leather hat and goggles featured in this podcast. Campbell broke the land speed record five times on Daytona Beach in the 1920s and 1930s. His leather hat and goggles are preserved at the Halifax Museum in Daytona Beach. Pioneers of the sport, like Campbell, from the United States and across the Atlantic in Europe, raced along the beaches of Daytona and Ormond Beach. These men were usually affluent and could afford to travel to these locations and bring with them their specialized cars for the expressed purpose of breaking the standing land speed record for the bragging rights of being the sole person who traveled fastest on the planet. The hat and goggles tell a story of this transatlantic competition. The hard packed sand in Daytona keeps trucks, cars, and motorcycles from getting stuck. This is what first attracted James Hathaway in 1902 to the idea of racing automobiles on the beach. Soon after, Daytona Beach replaced France and Belgium as the main location for breaking the land speed record. NASCAR historian Buzz McKim describes what Hathaway saw in this particular beach. The, the beach in the Daytona Ormond area was 26 miles long, 500 feet wide, and in the early part of the century, the automobile was kind of a newfangled toy of the rich. And they would come every winter for what they call the winter season from up north. Most of them were industrialists. They would stay at the Ormond Hotel, and they loved the beach because that was the only place that they could run their new toys wide open. At the time, in 1903, there was only 150 miles of paved road in the entire country, and most of that was around metropolitan areas. So there was really no place that they could get out there and see what their car could do. And you know, the old saying was the, the first race occurred when the second car was built. <laughs> so uh, the, the Daytona Beach area lent itself to speed trials. Dr. Randall Hall from Rice University here discusses other reasons why event organizers, such as New York promoter William Morgan, thought Daytona Beach was the perfect spot for racing. Obvious time to schedule an event in the south would be in the wintertime when these kind of events were, um, were prohibited farther north by the weather. And Morgan, this uh, promoter, immediately recognized the potential of a February racing event in Florida. The uh, Henry Flagler, who owned the Ormond Beach ho- the, the hotel at Ormond, was uh, obviously enthusiastic about it, as were the various uh, railroads that he owned. The railroads were able to bring the cars down. The uh, a lot of the wealthy families of, of the Northeast were already wintering in Florida, so they provided an audience uh, uh, support. And the result was a car racing event from 1903 to 1910 at Daytona. In 1902, Hathaway and a few other Americans arranged for Ormond Beach's premier race. Those who arrived were mostly well-to-do visitors who could afford to partake in the sport. Dr. Hall explains who these men were. 
the um, first racing in the South that I could discover was in 1903 at Daytona Beach. And it was definitely not a working class uh, origin for the sport. What was going on in Florida uh, in, uh, in, in, at the turn of the century was you know, rapid development of a tourist infrastructure, railroads, hotels, um, taking advantage of the beaches. And in 1903, a New York promoter, a sports promoter named William Morgan, decided to follow up on some uh, tips he had received that a uh, great spot to stage an auto racing event would be on the beach between Ormond and Daytona. He uh, was able to draw upon the enthusiasm of um, a, a large number of people who had already become interested in car racing in uh, other parts of the world and in other parts of America. The um, some of the principal racers at this this point in time were uh, men from either wealthy families who treated this as as their sport, their uh, entertainment, or uh, budding industrialists who were using car racing to test the new technologies they were developing for their automobiles. Soon, racers from both sides of the Atlantic arrived to try and break the land speed record. Dr. Hall explains the importance of the land speed record to international participants. The pursuit of speed records was not only a national, but it was an international phenomenon at this point, and it was changing quite rapidly because automotive technology was changing quickly. As a result, the, the AAA was uh, able to sort of serve as a voice of legitimacy in the timing of, of these, these trials. So the um, promoter, William Morgan, would, would coordinate with uh, the, the AAA to, to make this a legitimate event so that the records would apply in a worldwide uh, setting. The machines that began arriving in Central Florida were not the uniform race car seen in modern NASCAR races. Imagine your average race car. Now, in your mind, remove the entire top section of the automobile. Take away the windows and the windshield. Remove the bottom floor and make the tires smaller. All you should have left is a bare bones operation. The skeletal bottom of a car with a man perched atop a small seat, leaning forward to grasp the steering wheel for dear life. Remember our hat and goggles? This was all the protection a man had if something went wrong. Buzz McKim tells us that these objects weren't really intended for protection at all. All those guys ran was just that, that leather cap with the uh, the goggles, and those were glass lenses too. So if anything hit the lenses, then uh, you, know, you had glass in your eyes. So you know, safety was not a high priority in racing back in those days. So, uh, Sir Henry Seagrave, who came to Daytona in 1927, he became the first driver to crack the 200-mile-an-hour barrier. He was an Englishman, and he was the first driver to wear a helmet as we know it today. And uh, up until, you know, oh, probably the late 30s, um, he was about the only guy that was wearing a helmet. The danger of racing, however, deterred neither the drivers nor the participants. Dr. Hall describes some of the most famous participants who came to compete. The, the people involved there were, were quite eminent uh, in some cases, both on the technological side and on the uh, wealthy sportsman side. There were um, participants in these events between 1903 and 1910, such as uh, Ransom Olds, Lewis Chevrolet, Henry Ford, names that you immediately recognize in the automotive industry, but also um, wealthy men like William Vanderbilt Jr. Uh, of the Vanderbilt family and a uh, wealthy tobacco and real estate heir named David Bruce Brown. Uh, those men were uh, among you know, the, the leading Northeastern uh, elite and their passion was automobile racing. Drivers from Scotland, the Netherlands, and France soon competed alongside racers from the United States in Daytona. Dr. Hall explains the international nature of these races. I think of racing at this time as an international technological elite uh, interacting during a time of experiment in the auto industry. The um, Some of the People involved in, in constructing cars and, uh, and automotive technology were uh, interacting and, and competing internationally uh, to, to 
to create these breakthroughs. So the um, De Rock uh, Auto Company from France, these events as an opportunity to promote their brand and, and were actively involved. Some of the participants themselves were were part of an international circuit and competing with each other to uh, to, to create these speed records. So there were uh, people from France, people from England, were intimately involved from from the, in, in the competitions from the very beginning. And those that same international flavor would reemerge in the 1920s with uh, participants like. Uh, Malcolm Campbell and Henry Seagrave of of Great Britain coming to Daytona to compete for uh, speed records at that later date. Though some racers occasionally revisited Daytona in the 1930s, another land speed record was never again reached on the city's beaches. Buzz McKim describes the reason why sand racing in Daytona became unpopular. It was found that um, there was a little bit too much development along the ocean front, and there, you know, you're running almost 300 miles an hour in people's backyards. So, the uh, the land speed record folks decided, well, I think maybe we ought to find a new venue, and that's when they moved to the Bonneville Salt Flats out in Utah. So, um, here Daytona Beach had this incredible 30 plus year heritage of speed. Still. This was not the end of the story for racing, or for Daytona. As the land speed pursuits moved away, the launch of NASCAR replaced these early thrill seekers. The city soon would become world famous as a tourist destination. And yet, the hat and goggles from the Halifax collection remind us of the turn of the century international roots of the sport. Daytona was a meeting ground for the global pursuit of speed and sport. We hope you have enjoyed this episode of A History of Central Florida Podcast. For more information about the goggles and cap featured in this episode, visit the Halifax Historical Museum at 252 South Beach Street, Daytona Beach, Florida, 32114. Make sure to join us for our next episode titled Rum Runner.